This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of the word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we can come together this morning to reflect upon your word, to think through what you have revealed to us, that we might pursue the path of wisdom and not make foolish choices that may appear to be right to us, but the scripture says, end in death. Father, we pray for wisdom for those who are listening, those who desire to uh, apply and implement these principles in their life, that God the Holy Spirit would uh, use this to mature them, to give them that wisdom and skill they need in order to uh, continue to grow spiritually and to be uh, a, wise, or a source of wisdom and a wise testimony to those around them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. When God first created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, one of the first statements that we have in Scripture regarding their union is that uh, they were to glorify God together. Moses writes, for this reason, they were to leave father and mother, and the two became one flesh. That's the establishment of the institution of marriage. Marriage is not something that was developed by human beings over a course of time as just some sort of convenient thing that would uh, that that seemed to help organize society. Something that God created and initiated and inaugurated before there was ever sin on the planet. Now the question we ought to ask is why did he do that? Well, as part of God's command to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said that they were to be fruitful and to multiply. Now, that was a command that was given to them in the pre-fall period. It's not a command that was related in any way to dealing with the post-fall problem of sin or living in a corrupt world. It was always God's intent that uh, human beings in marriage, would have children and would then rear those children under the principles that God revealed and taught uh, to Adam and Eve. And that that is the, 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 the framework for God's training for passing on truth from generation to generation. And that hasn't changed. Just because of the fall, it, it, uh, things did not change. Those principles were still there. In fact, it's even more important now that we live in a corrupt world with corrupt fallen sinners and corrupt fallen children and corrupt fallen parents that we pass on the Word of God generationally because that's the only solution to the problem. Uh, all the problems that we have that we deal with and talk about are all superficial. The core problem is a problem of sin and human rebellion against God. And so the framework that God designed for training children and passing on the key eternal principles of his word from generation to generation is the family within the framework of a father and a mother and the children. Now, we know that we live in a fallen world, so there are a lot of different reasons why there's not a father, both a father and a mother present. We, Because we live in a fallen world, there are uh, frequently less than desirable circumstances. But God's grace gives us the, the ability to 
uh, to deal with those circumstances, and due to God's grace, we're able to face and solve many problems in life that aren't what they ought to be simply because we're living in this kind of a, uh, this kind of a fallen world. And Proverbs gives wise instruction to parents. And so as we're going through the last part of Proverbs, as it were, dealing with different topics, this morning I want to look at the topic of wise parenting. Now, some of you may want to just kind of check out right now because you're thinking, well, I don't have any children or my children are grown or my uh, children, uh, you know, have already, you know, failed. They don't care about the Lord. It's too late for me, whatever. It, this applies to everybody because at some point you may be in a situation where you can give advice and counsel to somebody you know. If you are not a parent but you're young, you may become a parent. If you are a parent and your children are grown, then there's always the potential of grandchildren. And you as a grandparent can give advice and counsel to your children as they rear your grandchildren. So there's lots of application here for all of us in order to uh, implement these principles of God's, God's Word. So the, the proverb starts off emphasizing that there is a central role for parents in training children. It's not the government's role to train your children. It's not the government's role to educate your children. We may utilize those systems that are in place, but you can't, when it's all said and done, you can't blame anybody but yourself for their failures in being educated or being trained. Same thing with Sunday school uh, or prep school. It's not the responsibility of the prep school teacher to train your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They are simply a tool that's available for you to use, but as a parent, it's your responsibility to teach and to train your children. So one of the first principles we see in Proverbs is that the major responsibility of parents, which is developed in Proverbs, is child training. If you're a parent, that's your responsibility, to train your children. Now, it's not your job to train children to be good children. It's not your job to train your children to be good adolescents. It's your job to train your children to be responsible adults. And in America, we have screwed up a lot of different ideas. We think that children, uh, children should be trained to be good children. But you, you, we're, the, there's a training process here, and your goal as a parent is to work yourself out of a job so that you don't need to be a parent anymore because when your child hits the age of 18, volitionally, legally, they're completely on their own. They may still live at home. You may still have rules and regulations they need to follow because uh, you're paying the bills. Every now and then I realize parents need to remember the golden rule and teach it well to their children. He who has the gold rules. To whatever degree you pay for their uh, room and board or for any entertainment in their life, to whatever degree you give them money, you control their volition. And you're not going to get away with that when they're 19 unless you start it when they're 19 minutes old. The sooner you start establishing your parental authority in, in, in relation to your children, the easier it will be. Now, some people may think, well, what do I know about it? I don't have any children. Well, that doesn't mean I haven't worked with children. I've spent years working with children, and I was a school teacher at one point, and I had the privilege of dealing with everybody's failures because I ran an in-school suspension class for two years. Greatest training I had for that was when I was in ROTC. Education classes had nothing to do with that um, with training me to handle all these juvenile delinquents. And you learn a lot by dealing with with kids. Every kid's different. Every kid's coming from a different background. Every kid's got different issues. But what they need to learn is is discipline more than anything else. And if you don't establish a strong disciplinary position from the very beginning, 
it's often too late. That's one of the first things that I remember as a counselor at Camp Penile that they would teach us as counselors is when those kids first come, as a counselor, you have to establish your authority in the cabin, your responsibility for those kids, because if you're permissive and you let them get away with things the first day, it's very difficult to regain that control. Same thing's true for a teacher in the classroom. The same thing is true for for parents. From the very beginning, it's always easier to lighten up than it is to get more intense. That's just the way life is. And the reason is, is because the child that you're dealing with is a sinner, and he's going to take advantage of whatever opportunities he has to get away with whatever he can get away with. And a lot of parents don't understand that when they start having kids, and consequently, they have problems later on. So what we see in Scripture is that the primary responsibility of a parent is child training, to train your children to be responsible adults so that they can live successfully. Now, that's a general broad principle, and that applies to everybody. But if you're a Christian parent, then part of your responsibility is to teach and to train your children so that they can be responsible, mature Christians when they reach adulthood. And at some point, they're going to transition from being uh, in the home and being under your authority to being out on their own. And hopefully when they make that transition, they will go through a shift where they're not just uh, worshiping the God of their parents, but that the God of their parents has become their God. And by that, I'm, I don't mean anything related to salvation, but we all know that there are a lot of, a lot of kids, and some of us, who when we got away from parental authority, we went through a time period of rejecting God, rejecting the truth, just living life as we wanted to live it. And eventually we figured out that, that maybe life wasn't so great when we weren't walking with the Lord like we had been at one point before. But, but kids go through that process where they have to transition from their parents' beliefs and their parents' uh, ideas and their parents' faith in God to where it's something that they're doing completely from, uh, from their own volition. Now, in the idea of child training, what we see in Proverbs, at the, the, the emphasis is more on correction than on the positive. And there's a reason for that. Uh, we live in a world today where a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't want to focus on the negative. I just want to focus on the positive. But that works, but that betrays also a hidden assumption about the nature of reality. As Bible believing Christians, we believe the nature of the reality of the world in which we live is that it is a fallen, corrupt world, and that people are born as sinners and uh, left on to their own devices, they are going to follow the path of least resistance, which is to give in to their sin nature and to follow the, the leading of their sin nature. And because as Bible-believing Christians, we understand that the, that the overall focus of the world is essentially corrupt and negative, then that has to be dealt with. That doesn't mean there aren't wonderful positive things and that kids cannot be wonderful and positive, but if left to their own devices without some sort of control, then their default position is always going to be in the direction of their sin nature. So one of the primary responsibilities of parents is in training is going to involve uh, correction. Now there's three key Proverbs that I want to talk about this morning. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. My opinion, this is one of the most misunderstood, abused, and distorted passages in Scripture, especially in relationship to, to uh, child training. And that's because it's not properly taught. This isn't a great translation. It's hard to get across in English the nuances of the Hebrew that are here. It really doesn't actually say in the Hebrew what it appears to say in the English, so we need to deal with that a little bit. Proverbs twenty nine seventeen says, Correct your son, and he will give you rest. 
Yes, he will give delight to your soul. So notice a positive parental experience with a an adult child who is pleasing and a blessing is related to a previous lifestyle of correcting. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So we need to look at these three passages, and we'll look at each one's each passage separately. So the second point I'm going to make, based on Proverbs 22.6, is that the parent's role is to motivate, stimulate, and challenge their children according to each child's personality and nature. It's your job as a parent to motivate, stimulate, and challenge each one of your children according to their individual personality and nature. And we get this from Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Often this passage is understood in this way. If you make your kids attend Sunday school and church regularly, and if you teach your children to know and obey the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, that's the real golden rule that you love one another or as you love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you teach them to pray at mealtime, bedtime, whenever there's a crisis, and you give them a steady diet of Bible verses, and if you do this early on, then even though teenage rebellion may come and they're going to sow their wild oats and, and they may get off track for a while, when their fling is over with after 3, 5, 10, 15 years, they'll always come back to God. And you can count on it because of this promise. Now, some of you may think and have heard that that pretty much paraphrases your understanding of this verse. Problem is, it's not true. Number one, the first reason it's not true is that, is that this is a proverb. It's not a promise. The difference between a proverb and a promise is a proverb states things that are generally true, but they're not stating things that are always inevitably true. Second thing that we ought to note about this verse is that it gives part of a picture of different things the Bible teaches about child training. It is not the one and only principle of child training in Scripture. We have to also recognize that the Bible teaches that every child has their own volition, and they may choose to reject everything that you teach them and train them. Uh, it's You can't put them in an environment where they're going to end up always doing what you think they should do. It isn't going to happen. Now, I know that's hard for some parents to understand, and it's especially difficult if you're a parent and you're dealing with a child that is perennially rebellious if they've turned against God, if they're hostile to God. And I know that there may be some of you who are holding out hope that someday, because you made sure that your kids went to church and you made sure that they were in Bible class, that they're going to always focus on the Lord or they'll come back to the Lord and love the Lord because that's the way you train them. That's not what this verse is saying. And sadly, too many people have uh, held on to this verse as a promise, and that's not what it, what it uh, describes. First of all, we have to understand what it means to train up a child, to train up a child. This is the uh, Hebrew verb chanach. It's only used a few times in the New Testament, and it is not the term that we see in other passages that indicate discipline, correction, and training for children. It's a distinct word. It occurs only eight times in uh, Hebrew, and then it occurs twice in the uh, Aramaic portions, or excuse me, another word, a uh, form of the word occurs uh, twice in the Aramaic portions of Ezra and Daniel. It means to dedicate, to inaugurate, and to initiate. The, the verb is the basis for the noun Hanukkah. So that you can hear that, Hanach, Hanukkah. And Hanukkah has the idea of uh, establishing and inaugurating a new feast as the, they reestablish the worship in the temple after it was shut down and, um, and uh, under Antiochus Epiphanes 
in the 3rd century B.C. Uh, The Hanukkah feast is mentioned in John 10.22 and usually falls towards the end of, uh, actually the end of November, which it does, I believe, this year. It's the earliest it's ever been, and the early, I don't think it'll be this early again due to some sort of quirk in the calendar. I think this year it falls the day after Thanksgiving. But it is a... um, it has to do with dedication. It has to do with consecrating something. And the basic meaning of this word has to do with dedicate, inaugurate, or to initiate something. On the screen, I pointed out that the, uh, it's, it's related to an Arab uh, cognate, Hanukkah, which refers to the practice of a midwife who would take a newborn infant and rub their gums with a with the juice of dates or oil. They would take um, dates and crush them, and then they would uh, put some on the end of their finger, and they would stick it inside the infant's mouth and massage the palate and the gums of the of the newborn. And this would initiate the infant's uh, sucking reflex, so that the they would begin to nurse as soon as possible. So it has to do with stimulating the gums of the infant in order to initiate the right kind of behavior. Now, this is used as a metaphor for parental training, that it's the role of the parents to initiate and inaugurate and to stimulate their desire for something at the earliest possible age. And so that's that's the idea there. So it's not just training, like we may think of uh, 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 the instilling of discipline and correction, which is a different word that we'll look at in a little bit. It has more to do with the idea of initiating and motivating uh, the child and their desire for something. It's um, The next phrase that we have is in the way he should go. Now, it's it would look on the surface that in light of the way that the writer of Proverbs talks about the way of a man, that there's the path or the way of the righteous and there's the path or the way of the foolish or the wicked, that this is talking about a volitional choice in taking a certain course or path in life. And in that, that's how most people understand this. And it's the idea of train up a child in the path or in the course of life that he should go. However, the word way is also used in a different way in Scripture, and that's why I put Proverbs 30, 18 to 19 up on the screen, because here we see that it has to do with individual uh, character or the individual nature of something. Uh, there are three things, the pro- proverb, writer of Proverbs says, there are three things which are too wonderful me- for me, four which I do not understand, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Now, the way here is not used in terms of a course or a path in life. It's talking about uh, the, the characteristic, the nature of each one of these uh, individual uh, individual things. So it has a, a broader use or a broader sense in which it refers to the manner, the normal manner in which something acts according to its own nature. And so what this would imply then is train up a child in the way he should go has to do with training them, stimulating them in terms of their basic individual nature or personality. Those of you who are parents of multiple children recognize they're not all the same. That what may motivate and stimulate one doesn't even phase the other one. And you have to deal with each one as an individual. That means that as a parent, if you're going to fulfill this, it's not superficial. It's not just, well, I'm going to make sure they're Bible class. I'm going to read the Bible to them every day. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, have them memorize Scripture. It's that you need to work with and really study and get to know your children individually and develop that relationship so that you're stimulating them and motivating them according to their individual personality and their individual life. It puts a lot of responsibility on the parent. 
One that you can't always do is in, in a situation where mom and dad are both working 60, 70 hours a week. This is why it's very difficult for good parenting to take place when both parents are working. Now, I know that we live in, a, in the devil's world. And we live in a world today where, uh, due to the pressures of the economic situation, it, is, uh, it might be mandatory in many cases for both parents to work outside the home just to make things work. We live in a world system that has worked against us uh, in an ideal sense uh, since the late 70s. A statistic that I ran across some years ago, a study sh- talked about the fact that in the early part of the 20th century, you had you still had most Americans lived in a rural environment or lived on the farm. In many cases, uh, the family worked the farm, and you had an income, a level of a lifestyle level that was achievable by that family. And but you, everybody worked. The mom worked the kids when they got up. They got up early to crack of dawn. They milked the cows or. Uh, got the eggs from the chickens, had all the chores to do. Everybody worked together. Then, as our society shifted to a more urban, uh, industrialized, and technology-based culture, uh, things shifted until we come to the period after World War II, time when many of us were, were growing up, and things shifted so that by the 1960s, we lived in a time when there was a lower tax rate for families much lower than today. We have a tax rate that's burdensome for families, but if you were parents and you had two kids and you were buying a house, you virtually paid no income tax uh, during that time period because the tax code was pro-family. So you had all these deductions and so you kept more more of what you earned. That doesn't happen today. So that in the mid-60s, now some of you can think back to that time, in the mid-60s, Dad worked. I know my dad left the house every morning at 7.20, and he was home at 5 o'clock. He was an engineer for uh, t- Tennessee Gas uh, Transmission, uh, Pipeline and Transmission Company. And when he retired in the late 80s, he was the, he'd been the head of their uh, safety codes and standards for, for many years. So he had, a, he had a very responsible job, and he had a, a lot of uh, uh, responsibility for others. He did tra- travel more and more after I got out of high school. But when I, when I grew up, it was like clockwork. He left every day at the same time, came home every day at the same time. We had dinner about 6.15, and by 6.30, we're done with dinner. And there was plenty of – my mom was at home, even though she was in a wheelchair. And because of that, we always had, had, to have, uh, had to have a maid to help out because she could not do a lot of things just by herself, like going to the grocery store and things like that. But, but she could take care of all those responsibilities of going to the cleaners, going to the grocery store, taking care of the house, and taking care of me. So by the time that, um, that I got out of high school, you know, it, we had a great life, one parent working. 1970, by 1980, remember those wonderful years when the Democrats controlled the economy under Jimmy Carter and we had double-digit inflation? And all of a sudden, and you, you wanted to go buy a house and you had to deal with a 12 or 14 percent uh, interest rate on your mortgage? In order to, and you had the same thing with car loans. In order for a lot of families to make it, Christian families who were really devoted to the principle of the husband being the primary uh, breadwinner, the primary wage earner, the wife had to go to work just to survive, just to be able to get a car, just to be able to pay the house note in order to go forward. Now, there were a lot of other things involved with that, but there was a huge economic shift. And, and uh, sociologically, Within the conservative evangelical community, you had a huge percentage shift and attitude shift where many wives and moms went into the workforce just to survive from that pressure from economics. We've been going through that same kind of thing again today, and it changes things. And then on top of that, you have problems in marriage, problems with a lot of uh, divorces that come along, single-parent household, so you have a real problem. But you have to do what you can do in light of the circumstances that you're in. And often those circumstances are dictated by a fallen, corrupt world. So we have to start with where we are, 
God always starts with where we are and not on the basis of some unachievable ideal. We work towards that standard, but sometimes we can't get there right away. The emphasis here is that the, the training that goes on has to start early. It's related to motivating, stimulating, and encouraging children in the direction of truth. And it's a more of a positive concept than a negative concept in this verse. And then the result is that in most cases, when they're old, they won't depart from that training. It doesn't say, you know, I often hear people, they mishear this verse. It doesn't say they'll come back to it. It says they won't ever depart from it. Okay? We have to understand what it says, not what it doesn't say. And so the principle is, if this is done right, then under most circumstances, they're not going to even go off and sow their wild oats. They're just going to stick with the plan and stick with the word all the way through. It's not a promise that they'll return. It is a proverb. It's just a recognition of the fact that under these circumstances, they will normally stay the course. But they have their own volition. And in many cases... When you have children who let their sin nature control, then they're going to choose to go uh, against you and against the way in which you have trained them. So that's the third point. Since each child is a sinner, correction is very much a part of training. And correction has a range of of uh, options. Uh, it can be... Uh, talking to them, it can be giving them a time out, it can be uh, removing privileges from them, but it always has to go in the direction of physical corporeal, corporal punishment. That is what the Word of God teaches, and that's what Proverbs teaches. And the reason is that given in Proverbs twenty two fifteen that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So the presupposition of Scripture is that Your lovely little baby is nothing more than a corrupt sinner, and without training and teaching them in the course that they should go, including teaching them the fact that when they make bad decisions, there are harmful, hurtful consequences, they can't learn that sometimes any other way than some sort of uh, corporal punishment. I know that there are some children that are so sensitive about that that even looking at the child as if you're displeased with them, they want to please you so much as a parent that they straighten up right away. Others need to go through a regular period where they are spanked and done in an appropriate manner. Spanking and physical punishment should never be done out of anger. When a child is very young and you start with a pop on the butt, uh, when you straighten them out, when, uh, straighten them up when they're disobedient, that can lead to uh, uh, situations as they grow older where you can sit down and talk to them. But you're not going to, you have to understand as a parent, you're not going to reason with them. You're not going to use psychology to get them going in the right direction when they're a year, 18 months, two years, three years. And you have to start even with corporal punishment when they're very young. Now, when they're just a baby, it doesn't take much, just a, uh, just a slight pop on the butt, and that's good enough. But it's clear from Scripture, clear from uh, Proverbs, that God not only endorses but mandates corporal punishment. Now, if you're out of line and you get angry, then that can go to something wrong. But my, I submit to you, what is worse? Le- you know, corporal punishment that becomes abusive or spoiling a child so that they never learn uh, the truth or they never learn right. Both are wrong. But just because you can take something to the extreme doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I won't talk about food and overeating. That would just be too obvious an illustration. If you have a problem overeating, the solution is not to starve yourself to death. 
If you've got a problem that you may not be able to handle uh, physical punishment correctly, the, the option is not to not do it at all. The issue is to do it correctly and to do it out of love. It is, all, it is m- more consistent with love to correct than to not correct. And the reason is, is that we have this thing called the sin nature, which we went over last time. And the basic orientation of the sin nature is the self. That's that little uh, watermark of the S I've embedded in the back of the sin nature. We're self-absorbed. We're we're self-absorbed, which leads to uh, self-indulgence. And we lead to self-indulgence, and that produces uh, uh, self-justification. And then self-justification leads to self-deception, and self-deception leads to self-deification. And it's all about me. And that's the way your child is. And it's the role of the parents to train them and teach them so that that changes, so that they learn to control their self-indulgent default orientation. Now, this is the same thing that God does with us. In the New Testament, we have a passage in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired or breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. It's instruction. That's the same responsibility of parents. Your job is to teach and instruct children. But that's not just an impartation of academic truth and information. It, the idea of teaching is always has an ethical, spiritual dimension to it because it's not just imparting facts. It's imparting information with a goal towards right behavior. And that's what the Scripture does. It's instruction towards right behavior and right living. As a parent, you are to instruct your children toward right behavior and right living. And then that, in, then the next two are negatives. But, oh, this is so terrible. See, this is why we don't like the Bible. Is it just so negative? We always have to do these horrible negative things, and God's just always telling us what's wrong. See, that the, this whole idea that we want everything to be positive it, it reflects just an unrealistic view of life and reality. The, the instruction is going to include reproof. Reproof is the idea of presenting a case that what you're doing is wrong. Now, some people just hate that. That's why you don't ever see them in church is because they can't handle somebody telling them that something they love to do is wrong. So they want to, they're so uh, mired in self-justification that for anybody to suggest that something they're doing is wrong, they just immediately think, oh, well, you're guilty of hate speech. You're just picking on me. You're just uh, accusing me of all kinds of wrong behavior, and therefore I'm not going to come to your church anymore. It's reproof points out what is wrong. Correction points out how to change it from the wrong path to the right path. That's what the Word of God does, and these same words are used for parents, including the next word for training in righteousness. And the Greek word there is paideia, from the root, meaning a child. So it, the, the whole idea of disciplined training goes back to uh, what is done with training and, and uh, rearing a child so that they, have, they can se- have self-discipline with regard to their own sin nature. Now, this is the same verbs, same, I mean the same words, same verbiage, same ideas that we have in Proverbs. For example, we're told in Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, and this is quoted also in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, uh, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he, uh, in whom he delights. So when we look at this particular passage, we see a key word here is the word uh, having to do with correction. This is the word uh, yasar, and sometimes it's uh, it, it's related to a noun, uh, musar, which relates to instruction. But it's a certain kind of instruction. It's an instruction that includes correction and the training of discipline so that something is is learned. And we see this repeated again and again in Scripture, Proverbs 3.11, which I just mentioned. Chastening, which is the word uh, yasar here, uh, or discipline, it could be translated discipline, the discipline of the Lord, 
uh, is related to correction. Uh, he who keeps instruction in, is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction uh, goes astray. See the word chastening in verse 11, the word instruction in verse 17, and um, uh, and then you have uh, as related to correction as the uh, uh, cognates, I mean as the uh, synonym. So the correction defines what is meant by this kind of in, uh, of instruction and warning and and rebuke. So this word emphasizes at its most basic level that the learning of these lessons is what's important and necessary for successful living. And that's your goal as a parent, is you want your child at the age of 18, 19, 20, and on to make wise decisions and to be successful at life. And in order to do that, then your job from the very beginning as a parent in parenting is not to be their friend, But you are their trainer. You're the one who would teach them values, to teach them self-discipline, to teach them how to control the instincts of their uh, uh, sin nature so that they uh, do not follow the inclinations of their sin nature, but they learn to control them. Why do we do this? Well, one reason that's given in the New Test uh, in Proverbs is Proverbs nineteen eighteen. Proverbs nineteen eighteen says, "Discipline your son while there is hope, and do not desire his death." This implies that you need to start this early. You can wait too long. If you wait beyond a certain point, it's too late to start trying to really train and teach your children because the bad habits of yielding to their sin nature have already been ingrained. And so, you, that's, again, that's why you have to start at the earliest age when there is still hope, when it's still going to have an impact, when it will still uh, change their, uh, their behavior. And the reason is, given in the second half of the proverb, don't desire his death. Because if you don't train them while there's still hope, then the result is that they're going to make bad decisions which are going to lead down that path of death, not necessarily physical death, but a death-like, miserable existence on the earth because of the bad decisions they make from a position of undisciplined, uh, of an undisciplined and undirected life. Now, in the context of the Old Testament, that also implies a physical death because in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 to 21, under the Mosaic Law, if a child was rebellious, and this is not just referring to somebody who acts out every now and then or somebody who smart mouths a, a parent, but a child who is incorrigible, a juvenile delinquent who continuously manifest the the, uh, unwillingness to respond to authority, that the parents are to bring them out into the public square, take them before the elders of the village, and then that child is to be stoned to death in the public. Now, some people say, oh, that's so harsh. See, there's that nasty judgmental God in the Old Testament again. No, you have to understand this in context. The context is that if you raise a juvenile delinquent, you've introduced... Uh, you, you've introduced a cancer cell into society. And if that cancer cell metastasizes, then it's going to affect all of the other cells. And so what do you do with cancer? You surgically remove it so that it can't destroy all of the healthy cells in the body. And so this is an extreme position because it's extreme behavior, but you have to protect the culture from self-indulgent, self-absorbed uh, narcissists that are raised by parents who don't, don't understand the value of wisdom or the value of discipline. And this, if you don't do it, then it leads to a breakdown and a failure uh, of that society and culture. The interesting thing, we don't have any examples of the Israelites in the Old Testament ever fulfilling that command. And so you see what happened is again and again they slip into idolatry and moral relativism and rebellion against God because they refuse to uh, truly implement the principles in the Mosaic Law for parental training of the next generation. In fact, Scripture makes it very clear on the value of uh, corporal punishment. Proverbs 13.24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son. 
Now, the divine viewpoint of love is that you are willing to take the time and the energy to properly and correctly discipline your children, which will include, in extreme cases, physical corporal punishment. But he who doesn't do that hates his child. But the one who loves him disciplines him promptly. It's not waiting till the next day, waiting several hours later. This is one of the reasons it's valuable for, for one parent to be home with the children all the time so that that misbehavior can be instantly dealt with. Uh, two hours later, especially when they're young, they have no memory of it. It has to be immediate negative consequences. Proverbs 19.18 says, Chasten your son while there is hope, and don't set your, your uh, heart on his destruction. If you don't do it, then you're going to set them on a path of death and destruction. Proverbs 23.13, Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Now that's not talking about beating him over the head. As a first sergeant I had one time said, always said, beat him over the head, head, neck, and shoulders. No, it's talking about applying the rod of correction to his rear end, to that soft padding that's below the back and above the thighs, and that gets his attention. Always got my attention. Proverbs twenty three fourteen says, You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. And the point that he's making here is that an undisciplined child grows into an undisciplined adult, and someone who is undisciplined is not going to be very successful at living a spiritual life. That what you have to train your child to respect is authority. And you can't make it anywhere in life without a respect for authority, and you're never going to get anywhere in your spiritual life if you don't respect the authority of God. And so the starting point for this respect for authority begins with the parent training that child, motivating them, inspiring them from the earliest age uh, to do the right thing. Proverbs 29.15 says, The rod and rebuke gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. See, if you just leave them to themselves, then all that selfishness just gets endorsed and it it gets enmeshed deep in their soul in these negative habit patterns, negative ways of thinking, negative ways of acting. And it leads to an adulthood where they're an embarrassment and a shame to their parents. Proverbs 29, 17 says, Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. So this isn't just one passage talking about the importance of physical discipline, but again and again and again we find this in the Scripture. But it has to be balanced or modified with love. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. In other words, don't do it in an abusive way because this creates a hostile reaction. Notice also it's directed to fathers. Fathers are the primary uh, leader in the home, not the mother. Too many fathers in our culture delegate responsibility to the wife. But that's not your job. Your job as a father is to be the primary disciplinarian. And I don't use that term in a physical, corporal sense. I mean, you are to train and produce discipline in the life of your child. And you need to emulate that in your life. And part of that means that you as a father should set aside time, uh, maybe before the kids go to bed at night, where you're the one who reads the scripture to them. You're the one who teaches them to pray. You're the one who is a source of that spiritual guidance and direction in the family. That doesn't mean that the mom doesn't do that as well, but your children need to understand that this is something that is just as important to you as it is to the mother. I remember in my first church, I had a uh, a lady who played the piano, and one day she was there. Her husband never came to church, and one day she came in, and she said, Well, Pastor, uh, my little boy, who was about five years old, said, Mommy, I'm not going to go to church today because men don't go to church. Only women go to church. And if you want to teach your children, men, if you want to teach your children wrong values, then you become a passive backseat driver in terms of uh, the spiritual leadership uh, in the home.
This is also emulated or seen in Proverbs 4, 3, and 4. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, it was the father uh, whose emphasis is on teaching and training the children. So if we want to raise children to value what we value, if we want to train children so that when they grow to maturity, they lead successful lives, then it takes a commitment on the part of parents. It takes a conscientiousness on the part of parents. It takes parents who recognize that they need to give up a lot of their own personal pleasure and a lot of the things that they enjoy doing so that they can spend the time and the energy to build those close relationships with their children so they can learn each one individually, so they can learn how to uh, train them, how to motivate them, how to stimulate them, each in terms of their own individual. Individual, uh, nature and always living a life that's that emulates the values you're trying to teach so that you become a model for them as to how they should live when they become an adult with our heads bowed and our eyes closed father thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon this critical part of proverbs and to be reminded of the value of parents and the value especially of fathers and of mothers, and the importance of taking time to truly build those those uh, intimate relations with children and to be uh, the spiritual leaders in the home for men, and uh, for, as parents emulating and stimulating those children uh, towards spiritual things, starting from an early age. Father, we recognize that we live in a corrupt world, but you have solved the problem of sin and corruption because you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here or anyone listening to this message, that they might come to understand that that salvation is a free gift, that you sent your Son to pay the penalty for us, and that all we need to do is accept that gift uh, given to us, provided for us freely, and that it's not based on anything we do. It's not based on it, uh, morally reforming our lives or changing anything. It's based on simply recognizing Christ died for our sins And because of that, if we believe that, we have eternal life. Father, we pray that you would challenge us with the things we've studied this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.